Hello everybody and welcome to this video. So far we've been getting quite a feel for the concept of equilibrium and a reversible reaction. Now this video is moving on to relate the observations made about a system reaching equilibrium to our good old pal collision theory. The relevant dot points for this stuff can be found on the video page. And to cover this, we'll start by recapping what an equilibrium is. Then we're going to use collision theory to explain the observations we make about our system as it approaches equilibrium. So to start us off, before we begin to explain the observation of a system approaching equilibrium to collision theory, let's have a little recap of what an equilibrium actually is. A load of chemical reactions we come across are reversible, meaning they can go both ways. So for this example here, A plus B can react to give C plus D, or in the reverse reaction, C plus D can also react to give A plus B. Now at the very beginning of the reaction, we'll only have the reactants, A and B. As the reactants get used up, more and more of C and D will be formed. The point at which these concentrations no longer change with time is a state of equilibrium. At this point, the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are equal. And this is going to be key to incorporating collision theory into this video. Now, if we're thinking about reaction rates, the two major points for a reversible reaction that's heading towards a state of equilibrium are that as the reactants get used up, the forward reaction slows down. And, as more product is formed, the reverse reaction speeds up. Of course, eventually these reach a point where the rates are equal and the equilibrium is reached. So let's now take a look at why this is and then relate it to collision theory. We've covered collision theory before, but remember, it states that particles will only react successfully if they collide under specific conditions. It states that a reaction won't take place between two colliding particles unless they collide with at least a minimum amount of kinetic energy and they collide with the correct orientation. They need to be facing each other the right way. But more broadly speaking, we saw that if we hold everything else constant and more collisions occur due to a higher concentration, then the reaction would proceed more quickly. Let's use a graph to apply this to reaching equilibrium. Here I've got a plot for the relative concentration of reactants and products on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis. Of course, we could make a graph with a separate line for each individual reactant and product, but there's no need for the point I'm going to make in this video. Initially here, we can see the concentration of the reactants is high, and that here, the concentration of the products is low. We're saying it's actually zero, as the reaction hasn't even begun. Now, as time progresses, product is being formed, so the concentration of the product is increasing, whereas the reactants are being used up, so the concentration of the reactants is decreasing. This continues until we reach a point where the concentration of the reactants and the products stay constant, at this point, we have reached equilibrium. Okay, so let's relate what is happening to the concentrations of the reactants and products to the rates of the forward and reverse reactions using collision theory. If you've seen our earlier videos on collision theory, you'll know we can do this by asking ourselves a series of questions. But I'm going to alter these just slightly to make these specific to looking at reversible reactions reaching equilibrium. One, what happens to the reactant and product particles over time? Two, how does that affect the number of collisions between the reactants and between the products? Three, do more reactant or product particles now satisfy the conditions of collision theory? And four, what happens to the rate of the forward and reverse reaction? It's best to think about one direction of the reaction at a time, so let's start with looking at the rate of the forward reaction, caused by the changes in the concentration of reactants. So looking at our set of questions on collision theory, with question one, we aren't externally changing any conditions this time, but the concentration of the reactants is decreasing as time goes on. So what does that do to the reactant particles? Well, simply put, it reduces the number of them. Next question, how does that affect the collisions of the reactant particles? Now, if we have fewer reactant particles, they aren't going to be colliding as frequently, so there are fewer collisions occurring. Next, do more particles now satisfy the conditions of collision theory? Now, neither reducing the number of particles or collisions affects the amount of energy or the orientation of those particles. So the likelihood of any given collision of the reactants resulting in a reaction has not changed. But because their concentration is lower, there's less reactant collisions happening. So there's now less reactant particles meeting the conditions of collision theory. So overall, we can see that as the reaction progresses, the decreasing concentration of the reactants means we get fewer successful collisions, so we get a decrease in the rate of the forward reaction. Now, on the other hand, 
we can go through all those questions for the reverse reaction. So, as the time progresses, we found that the concentration of the products increases. This increases the number of product particles. That, in turn, increases the number of collisions occurring between the product particles. Once more, this doesn't directly affect the energy or orientation of any of these particles, so any given collision between the products isn't any more likely to result in the reverse reaction. But, just by increasing the amount of product particles colliding, we still increase the amount of successful collisions between product particles overall. That means that the reverse reaction will increase as time progresses. Let's finish up by plotting the rates of the forward and reverse reactions against time. We'll put it side by side with the concentration plot so that you can relate the two. As you can see, the graph of the reaction rates over time actually looks super similar in shape to the concentration plot. The forward reaction rate starts off high and decreases as the number of reactant particles decreases. The reverse reaction rate starts off low but increases as the number of product particles increases. They both finally reach a point where the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction and this system is now at equilibrium. It is worth noting that the relative concentrations of the reactants and products aren't necessarily, or even often, equal at equilibrium but you can say for sure that the rates of the forward and reverse reaction will be equal. Okay guys, that brings us to the end of this video. I'll pop on screen now the main points to take away from all this. But essentially all we've done is apply collision theory to understand the observed increase or decrease in the rates of the forward and reverse reactions as the system approaches equilibrium. Anyway, that's it from me. I'll speak to you guys in the next one.